Let's give God praise that we get to praise him in his house today. So glad you're here today. Thank you for coming out to Freedom Church. If it's your first time, we are thankful that you are here. God has a plan for your life like he does each of us. So, so glad you're here. Today is the first day of the rest of your life. So let's just give God praise for that. We're living, we're breathing, and we get to be able to praise him. So today, I'm going to start a brand new series about Adam and Eve And we're going to be looking at the perspective of the man's role and the woman's role and there so on. So we're excited about that. I hope you're excited about that. And with that being said, we are offering a date night for those of you that are married and you you have children. We want to watch your kids. We want to set up for a great night for that. If you'd like to take advantage of that, be sure to fill it out on your connection card. Or you can hit the QR code on the back of your seat. Sign up for date night. That will be Friday night, February 16th. Check out in your handout or check out on there the particulars of that. Sign up for that while there is room for people to be able to be a part of that. So as we move forward and we're thinking about our positions as men and as women, how many of you would say that men and women are different? Right? Right? I'm just not talking about in physical shape. We're just different. And uh, so when you think about it, I think about how that for Shannon and I, it's opposites attract. I remember very vividly whenever I was driving my 1975 Triumph Spitfire convertible with the top down, she flagged me down and asked me to take her for a ride in my car. And I thought she was interested in the car and not in me. But then we began dating and man, I waited a long time and I proposed to her three months later. And she thought that I was crazy. Uh, She wasn't ready for that. She was young and thought, man, I don't know if I'm ready for this whole marriage deal. But she had a way of letting me know after that time and on February uh, around Valentine's Day. And I was able to propose to her. And you know what? This September 16th, we will be married 35 years. (laughs) Praise God for that. Three daughters and 10 grandkids, and they're still counting them. They're still having them. But anyway, with that being said, and you think about men and women, you know, I I think about a lot of the messes that people get into when it comes to relationships, especially, you know, they just don't live out God's principles. They don't live out how God made us. And so there's all kinds of emotional pain. There's all kinds of mess ups in that. And, And this relationship series Today, I'm going to kick it off being on the up and up because we're going to look at Adam and Eve and how God made them. And so today, I'm going to be talking to the men. So I'm going to give you one mulligan, ladies, right now. You can elbow, if your guy's near you, elbow him and say, this is for you. I'm going to let you do that right now, okay? All right, now, now, here we go. Next week, I'm going to talk to the women. And this is your one mulligan, men, that you can elbow your wife, be gentle, You can elbow your wife and say, next week's for you. Go ahead. It's all right. So, but that's all the picking on each other that I want you to do today. So, with that being said, when I'm talking to the men, it reminds me of this guy. He he wanted to be more assertive, and he didn't want to be passive. So, he reads this book on relationships, and he says, you know what? I'm going to go home, and I'm going to be the man of the house. So, he gets home. He walks in. He looks at his wife, and he says, hey, here's what's going to happen from now on. I'm going to be the man of the house. When I get home, I want you to have a gourmet meal on the table for me. I want you to make sure that you run my bath. And I, you know what? Guess who's going to comb my hair and pick out my clothes when I get out of the bath? She said, I know who the mortician is. <laughs> so, guys, today is not about you being so assertive and being so bossy-like. It's about you being who God made you to be in this role as being a man. So, how many of you ready for the Word of God? Say Amen. amen. All right, we're going to jump in. But before I do, I want to say this. You're thinking, wow, man, I, I'm, I'm here today and I'm in the wrong place. You know, so whether you've been married many years or you just got married or whether you are engaged or you're divorced or you're single or you're separated, humanity is not batting a thousand when it comes to relationships. Would you agree with that? If so, say yes. And so we want to learn together 
how to stay together after we say, I do, by doing what God says. So here's what I want to say to you. No matter where you are in life, no matter what happened yesterday, you can't change those kind of things. Today's a new day. And what I want to challenge you to do over this series, be here, invite someone to come with you. Always be inviting someone. Freedom Church exists to reach people to know God. And we want you to know Him for how He created you, to have the great life He created you for. But I hope and pray you'll adhere and put into play in your life these powerful principles. Let's jump into the first book in the Bible in Genesis chapter chapter one, you can pull out the outline you got when you come in, or you can pull out your Bible, turn on your Bible. It says, then God said, let us make human beings in our image to be like us. When he says to be like us, he's talking about God, the father, God, the son, God, the Holy spirit, the triune God don't have time to break that down. But when he's saying to be like us, he's not saying in the physical sense, but he wants us to reflect God's glory. He wants us to be able to reflect God's love, his patience, his forgiveness, his kindness, his faithfulness, because you're made in God's image. This is what I want you to get. You are a person of worth. Don't let anybody tell you because of the circumstances of how that you you were born, that you were a mistake or anything like that. So you need to really feel good about who you are in God and who God made you to be. And knowing that your worth helps you to be able to love God, know him personally, have a relationship with him and understand this, no matter at times in our lives, I think the enemy comes in and he tries to make us feel worthless. You are valuable. Look at the person next to you and say, you're valuable. Now look back to the other one and say, you're valuable too. Now, let's jump to Genesis chapter 2. Let's read a verse here. It says, the Lord God placed the man in the garden of Eden to tend and watch over it. In other words is, God gave instructions to Adam as also kindled with a warning to Adam. And Adam had a choice to, to fulfill what God was telling him to dress and keep the garden. Now, we know that Adam went and named all of the animals. That was a job that he had to do. So, imagine he was very creative in the beginning of it. And he would look up and he would see a giraffe and say, giraffe. And then he'd see a hippopotamus. But after they're all walking by him, he is getting to where that he is getting a little bit depressed, I believe, a little bit. He's sitting there looking, there's no one like him. And he still named them. And he gets to the point of just saying, cow, <laughs> dog pig. So he ends up naming them and there's nothing like him. And, and God wanted to be able to have Adam to be able to have this magnificent marriage relationship. So what does God do? He wants to make someone like him. So he puts him into this deep sleep and look what it says here on down in Genesis 2, beginning with verse 22. It says, then the Lord God made a woman from the rib and he brought her to the man. At last, the man is clean. This one is bone from my bone and flesh from my flesh. She will be called Whoa Man. Can you imagine when she walked up and he saw her after looking at all the animals? He said, Whoa Man. <laughs> yeah, he's sitting there thinking. So, because she was taken from man. This explains why a man leaves his father and mother and is joined to his wife, and the two are united into one. God is the creator of marriage. God gave the gift of marriage to man. He gave it to Adam and Eve. He gave it to humanity. God's plan for marriage from the beginning is one man, one woman, one flesh for one lifetime. Man leaves his parents. That's a public act. They promise themselves to one another in a covenantal relationship. And the man and woman are basically joined together. They're submitting one to another. They take responsibility for each other, loving each other above all others. The two are united into one, committing themselves in a sexual union that's reserved only in marriage. And marriage also, so you understand, is a beautiful illustration of the loving, intimate relationship of Jesus Christ and his church. Look at verse 20, 25 now. It says, now the man and his wife were both naked, and, but they felt no shame. How did, why did they not feel any shame here? Because of their innocence. How many of you here have children? Raise your hand, you have children. You remember your children when they're little and maybe you still have little ones. They're about this tall and they run around naked and they don't think anything about it. Right? You know what I'm talking about. Because of their innocence. That's why that that is. See, Adam and Eve, 
they were not ashamed because they were innocent. There was no sin yet. And Adam and Eve were not embarrassed by their nakedness. And so Adam is in love with Eve, and Eve is in love with Adam. They're one. They're having fun. However, that only lasted six more verses. Check this out. So the man and woman, they're in this oneness. They're in this unique relationship in their roles. They are together. The question is, a lot of times with people, are you together in that relationship that God has given you, but you're really not together. In other words, are you kind of thinking one direction, men, and your wife's thinking another direction? We got to get real today, men. We have to get real when we think about who we are in a relationship with God. And with that being said, I want you to think very clearly, if you don't get anything else today, gentlemen, Will Jesus be part of my life or lead my life? That's what I want you to grasp more than anything. Why is it so, so important? I want to share some staggering stats with you today. These stats are a few years old, but, and we, we, you know they're subjective, but they make the point because there's truth behind it. 90% of men in prison have had no relationship with their father. 44% of those living in poverty level in America are single moms. Now, what does that mean? A man was man enough to lay around, but the man wasn't man enough to stay around. So I want to encourage you single moms. We love you, and we love your children. And we want you to know that here at Freedom Church. 41% of women today are having children out of wedlock. 63% of youth suicides are from fatherless homes. 90% of all runaways are from fatherless homes. 85% of children with behavioral disorders are from fatherless homes. 80% of all rapists are from fatherless homes. 71% of high school dropouts are from fatherless homes. 71% of teenage pregnancies happen in fatherless homes. So why is this so important? Your role is huge in life. You are not meant to be a man that Jesus is a slice of your life, but Jesus is everything in your life. And so today, I want to challenge you men to step up and become the man that God created you to be. Now, ladies, here's one thing I don't want you to do. I don't want you to go home and be dogging him about stepping up in any area of, your li of his life. You let the Holy Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit of God is going to nudge him to go in the direction that God wants to do. Let God do that in his life for any area that he needs to step up into. So today it's time. First and foremost, it's time to man up, guys. You say, what do you mean, man up, pastor? It's time to be brave and tough enough to deal with things that may be unpleasant or some kind of unpleasant situation. You need to get real about your relationship with God. Knowing about Jesus ain't really knowing Jesus. It's just not. Or a lot of people know about Jesus, but they don't really know Jesus. So when it comes to following Jesus, here's my question, gentlemen. Does Jesus know you're following him? Does he know it? By the life you're living? Do you have that intimate relationship with him? Do you walk with Jesus, talk with Jesus on a consistent daily basis? Look what it says going back to the very first book of the Bible again in chapter 1 beginning with verse 1. In the beginning, say that word out loud. In the beginning, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was formless and empty and darkness covered the deep waters. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the surface of the, of the waters. See, God created the universe. Fourth word in the Bible, God created everything and he chose to create, uh, create you and I as the apple of his eye. We are valuable and he loves us and he loves us so much he'd give his son for us. God created you me, men, and women, so he could have a relationship with us in our lives. However, when we look at our church, this is what I don't understand, but our church in particular is made up of 59% women and 41% men, which tells me very clearly that the women are more interested in a relationship than what the men are interested in a relationship with Jesus. Men don't like to talk about their feelings. They don't like to talk about it at all or their emotions. 
How many of you men here, and I'm, I want to I ask you to be honest with me and raise your hand. Be vulnerable a minute. How many of you men here were taught when you were growing up not to cry? Raise your hand real high, real high. Look at here. Now, why is that? Oh, suck it up, boy. You don't need to cry. That's what you hear. If you're not careful, you've got to use these tear ducts in the corner of your eyes, gentlemen, to be able to cry and let some of that emotion out so your head does not swell up and burst with pride. Because pride will always take you for a ride away from your relationship with Jesus. I hope you understand that. You Do you have a relationship with God through Jesus? Do you know that he is in your heart? Do you know your name is in his book? And until you man up that you've prayed up, you can't live up to what God planned up for your life. You're going to miss it. And the worst thing you could ever do is be born and miss the very reason that God created you. Man, you want to grasp that today. Don't miss that. Man up in this moment. Look at 1 Corinthians verse 15 and 22. Look what Paul said to the church at Corinth. Just as everyone dies because we all belong to Adam, everyone who belongs to Christ will be given new life. I want new life. I want you to have new life. I want you to experience that life. But not only is it time to man up, gentlemen, it's time to stand up. You say, what do you mean stand up, pastor? You got to be courageous and be that loyal stand up kind of a guy. You ever had to stand up, gentlemen, and show your kids you mean business? Can I get a witness? You know what I'm saying. You've had to stand up and let your kids know you mean business, that I'm your dad. You're going to listen to me. My name means something. And you know what? This is for all the parents here. How many of you parents get tired of repeating yourself? Hello. You repeat yourself and you repeat yourself and you repeat yourself because a lot of times your kids don't listen. Well, Adam was given the instructions here for his best and for his wife's best, but they didn't listen. The kids didn't listen. So here we're fixing to see that we went from a wedding to a war. Check it out. Genesis 3 verse 1. The serpent was the shrewdest of all the wild animals the Lord God had made. One day he asked the woman, did God really say you must not eat the fruit from any of the trees in the garden? So what does Satan do? As he always does. He begins to help you to have bouts with doubts. To make you question God's word and God's goodness. That's what he does here. And he begins with this discouragement. To make you feel discouragement that you don't have something. And he makes you look at the problem that you have rather than to God in the relationship. Of course we may eat from the fruit eat fruit from the trees in the garden. The woman replied, it's only the fruit from the tree in the middle of the garden that we are not allowed to eat, God said. You must not eat it or even touch it. If you do, you will die. You won't die, the serpent replied to the woman. God knows that your eyes will be opened as soon as you eat it, and you will be like God, knowing both good and evil. Here is a diversion tactic from our enemy that hates you, me, and everything that has anything to do with God. The diversion tactic is to make the wrong things seem attractive so you won't want more of the right things. Do you follow what I'm saying? Say yes. So the woman was convinced. I talked about this a few weeks ago. What do you do with a woman that's convinced? Nothing. Okay. Same thing with a man. When you are convinced about something, we can't, you can't do anything. When you make your mind up, and her mind was made up here, she saw that the tree was beautiful and its fruit looked delicious, and she wanted the wisdom it would give her. So she took some of the fruit and ate it. Then she gave some to her husband. Look at these next four words. Who was with her, and he ate it too. Now, that tells me that Adam was right there with her. It says he was with her. And how many times are you and I, gentlemen, are going to stand by and let somebody bow up on our wives and do something like it? He was very passive in this moment, not living out what God had made him to do. And listen, men, we have to stand up against the enemy who comes near anyone that God has given us. You got to let Satan know who you are, whose you are, and whose they are in your life. You have to do that. Satan doesn't care. Listen to me. Satan doesn't care that you know God as long as you don't make him the Lord God. You say, what do you mean? There's a huge difference. Take your Bible this week 
And here's what I want you to do. I want you to take your Bible and I want you to look at chapter 2 of Genesis. And I want you to underline every time it says, the Lord God, the Lord God, the Lord God. You say, what do you mean? In my Bible, it's 12 times. He, the Lord God calls all the shots in your life. That's what happens. So you got to think about just, is God just God to you, a part of your life? Because if he's just a part of your life, you're going to put him on the shelf and, until you come back next Sunday. So only God knows when you need him in a way, in a sense of needing him all of the time. And God knows that every one of us need him in our hearts and in our lives. And you know what? I want God to know, God, I need you 24-7, 365. But a lot of times when we're looking to him as just God, when he says something different in his word, we don't want to listen to that. We don't want to have that as part of our lives if we disagree with what God says. Listen, man, I asked you a question. Is he the Lord God in your life or is he just God? When you look to Jesus in your life, is Jesus who your Lord and Savior? Are you becoming more like Jesus, gentlemen, or are you coming less like Jesus? It's time that you say, you know what, I'm going to take a stand. I'm not going to let him come against me and my household. As for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord, and we're going to be who God created me to be. I don't want to miss that. Listen to me, gentlemen, especially single men. You have an opportunity to be a, a, a change agent where you're at. If you're not careful, if you follow the ways of the world, you'll follow a very pattern of getting the things to come towards you of what you want to do. An enemy's going to lay out this great, big, beautiful scene of what it is for you to have in the world that's apart from God. Listen, men, single men, run after the heart of Almighty God if you want to be able to live after the very reason He created you and gave you purpose and wants to let you live that purpose out. You be sure that you don't run after the world that's out there trying to tell you to run after premarital sex and run after the things and go test everything out. That's not the way for a man, and it's not the way for a woman. I love the time that a grandpa was having a, a, having a conversation with his grandson. And the grandson said, Hey, Grandpa, what did, in your generation, it's different than now. What'd you wear for safe sex? He said, Oh, that's simple, son. We wore a wedding band. You can call me old fashioned. I call it God. I call it His ways, a pure and undefiled. How you treat a woman, men, is paramount. Nowhere in the scripture will you find where it says the woman dies for the man, but the man is to die for the woman as Christ gave his life for the church. We're to serve that woman. It's important how you talk to your wife. We can be abrasive and we can be overbearing at times, but remember, she's gentle and a gentle spirit. And even as she comes at you, you still treat her with love and respect. Think about how you talk to your girlfriend. How you're talking to your girlfriend, do you think she'd receive a ring if you, if, she, if, you, if you ask her to marry you? How are you talking to her? How are you treating her? It's important. Man, we got to spend time with our kids. Let me tell you something. The worst thing it can be is have these devices in their face all the time. Nothing wrong with using devices and things like that. But how much face-to-face -face time without a device are you spending with them and loving them and giving them direction? How much time are you being a giver like Jesus? Jesus was so generous. Are you a giver, man, in your life? Or are you just somebody that's take, 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 take? What are you doing, man, about leading your family when it comes to Christian virtues? Are you praying with your wife? Are you reading the Bible with your family? Are you praying with your children? When it comes to Sunday, is it ever a time that your kids come up to you and says, are we going to church today, Daddy? That's one question you never want your kids to ask you. That question was never uttered in my household because what I wanted to do is for them to fall in love with Jesus, not this world. If you're not careful, the way you lead gentlemen in your home, they're going to watch you and see what's happening in your life. And they're going to look at you and they're going to wonder, you know, what's really important to dad? When it comes to being in your relationship with Jesus, they need to know that you love Jesus above all. 
How about baptism? Next Sunday, we're having a baptism, and this is for everybody here. If you've given your heart to Jesus, sign up for baptism today on a QR code or on a card. Drop it in the offering when you get done. Go public with who you say you love above all. Take that relationship to the next level with Jesus Christ. Also, what are you doing as far as being a part of God's church? How many of you here, I want to ask you to, to raise your hand. How many of you here say that Freedom Church is my church family? Raise your hand all across the auditorium. Now ask yourself this question, those of you who raise your hand. Where is your place of serving in this church? If you can't name it, then say, hey, I want to serve in my family. When it come to my family, when I was raising my girls, everybody had responsibility in our house. There was no free rides. So where are you serving at? When you think about your family, where are you serving? How are you leading the way, gentlemen, to be a leader in your home, to be a leader for your wife, to be a leader for your kids, to be a leader for your workplace, to be a leader for your church, to be a leader for your community? We're either leading or we're falling away. There's no in between. How about next steps? Those of you here, gentlemen, need to say, I'm going to let this church know that this church means the world to me. You've never been to next steps. We're having our next steps where you can come and find out the inside scoop of Freedom Church. That's happening February 11th. Love for you to be a part of that. God is doing amazing things in our church and people's lives are being changed. Addictions are being broken. Marriages are being mended. Friends are being able to have fine friends and people are loving each other, cherishing each other and being there for each other. It doesn't get any better than what happens in the local church and it's happening at Freedom Church and I'm so glad you're a part of it. God is doing amazing things. Bottom line to it is, gentlemen, let me say this. What you lead tells exactly what's important to you and everyone in your circle of life knows it. What if men became as dedicated to the church, which is the hope of the world through Jesus Christ, as men they are to their kids' sports programs? When kids get messed up in the world. A lot of times the family brings them back to the church hoping that we can do something to get them fixed. And you know what? We're glad to help, but we could have helped a lot more if you would have consistently had your kids here throughout the years before they got infiltrated. I love sports. There's nothing wrong with sports. Nothing wrong with your kids being in sports. Your kids are awesome. You know why I know your kids are awesome? Because you put their little pictures all across the back of your minivan, all the way across, including your dog. That's how I know they're cool, you know. But listen, if you parents would stand up and say no more Sunday sports, then you would send a message and the leagues would get a message when you don't show up. And then God's day would be holy again for the whole family instead of looking at it as something else. I just want you to understand this. You would send an example to your kids that Jesus isn't just a part of our family, that, that Jesus leads our family above all. As the Lord God. Let's give the Lord God praise. He deserves in the house today. So it's time that we man up, gentlemen. It's time that we stand up, but also we got to own up. And you say, what do you mean by own up? You need to either admit or confess when you've done something wrong or embarrassing in your life. And if you're not careful, you're going to be tempted. This is what happens to a lot of men. They don't own up. They give up. I just don't try anymore. And I'm not trying, gentlemen, to make you feel condemned. That's not my job. That's the Holy Spirit's job to touch your heart and convict you of what's going on in your life. I'm just trying to get you to simply confess about things so that things don't get messed up in a way they're irreparable. Only God can repair it, but sometimes we take it to a level that the devil wants to make you think this is irreparable and you give up. Does that make sense? Say yes. Look at Genesis 3, continuing on in verse 7. At that moment, their eyes were opened, and they suddenly felt shame at their nakedness. They sewed fig leaves together to cover themselves. See, Adam tried to cover his sin. Why? Because he went from innocence to guilty to embarrassment. They went from being secure in a relationship to God to being insecure in their sinful selves. So they needed to put something together to cover up the mess they were in. Look at verse 8. When the cool evening breezes were blowing, the man and his wife heard the Lord God walking about in the garden, so they hid from the Lord God among the trees. This is funny. They thought that these fig leaves could help them to hide 
from an all-knowing, all-seeing God. And we'll do the same as if we think that you and I can actually hide from God. Do you understand that a guilty conscience is a warning signal that God puts in all of us that goes off whenever that we do wrong? And after putting on the fig leaves here, they were insecure with each other as Adam and Eve, and they were insecure with God. So that's why when you come to church, sometimes you feel uncomfortable. If you're struggling in a messed up relationship with a spouse or with a girlfriend or boyfriend or with others or most of all with God, listen, you can run from God. But you're never going to outrun God. It's just not going to happen. It says in verse 9, Then the Lord God called to the man, Where are you? As if God didn't know. It's a great question for all of us. God knew where they were, but he was desiring that intimate fellowship that he once had with them. But they were hiding from the shame of their sin. He replied, I heard you walking in the garden, so I hid I was afraid because I was naked. Who told you you were naked? The Lord God asked. Have you eaten from the trees whose fruit I commanded you not to eat? So how can two people meet each other, fall in love, get married, enjoy this honeymoon in a wonderful place, and go from a magnificent marriage momentum to an absolute mess? We read on. The man replied, it was a woman you gave me who gave me the fruit and I ate it. Then the Lord God asked the woman, what have you done? The serpent deceived me. She replied, that's why I ate it. The blame game begins right here. It's always somebody else's fault. Never our fault. We don't take ownership. We don't take responsibility. Always somebody else's fault. So Adam here plays the victim card. And that's what a lot of people do today. They play the victim card. Blaming everybody else instead of owning up. So I'll tell you, gentlemen, it's time to man up. It's time to stand up. And it's time to own up. And owning up, it says in Proverbs 28 and 13, anyone who refused to admit his mistakes can never be successful. Never be successful. But if he confesses and forsakes them, he gets another chance. Owning up to the person in the mirror that has messed up Understand, this is the key to peace. Now, I will tell you, it's not going to be easy. It never is, but it will give you the opportunity to make things right. So let me say this to you. Stop blaming everybody else. Stop blaming your dad. Stop blaming your mom. Stop blaming your ex. Stop blaming the way you were raised. Stop blaming about everything that's going on in your life. And it's just time that you step up and you own up. For what God wants you to do. You know what? Victims will never walk in victory in God. It just won't happen. It's time that the sin cycle stops. And you say, today it's going to stop with me. That's what I want you to get. No matter how you've messed up, no matter what you've done, here's what I want to tell you, gentlemen, and everyone as well. God's grace is so much bigger than any sin that you have ever committed. And listen to me, man. God has you here to show you His love is real. He is true. He is faithful. And He wants you to experience the fullest of His love. He wants you to be able to know that you can change, that you can love and that you can lead as he has created you to be able to lead. So I want to challenge you to take ownership of where you're at today in your life, to step up as men, step up as husbands, step up as fathers. I want to challenge you to be able to preserve what God has preserved you for in the womb, to go for it, to be able to serve, to be able to protect, to be able to to be that person that's going to provide, to be able to live with honor and respect for those that God has given you. If the enemy's coming at you, he's coming at your marriage, he's coming at your home, he's coming at your kids, it's because you simply let him. Satan hates you and he hates me. 
And you know how Satan gets at God? Satan gets at God at getting at each and every one of us. That's how that he does that. And so the same power, listen to me, that raised Jesus back to life out of the tomb is the same power that you can have in your life in order to be able to take him out. Greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. You just got to say, talk to the hand, Satan, because I don't understand. My God is here for me. He's never going to leave me. He's never going to forsake me. He's going to take me to the end of this world. And you can't have my family. You can't have my wife. You can't have my kids. You cannot have it. I'm not going to let you. Satan has no right except the rights that you give him in your life. And that's the bottom line to it today, church. We often break the heart of God because we follow our sinful nature and we don't seek a path of restoration. I hope you understand that. Here's a verse that a lot of people really don't understand the depth of it. Genesis chapter 3, verse 21. Check this out. And the Lord God made clothing from animal skins for Adam and his wife. See, God removed the flimsy fig garments that Adam and Eve had made. And God provided acceptable garments that he provided. Innocent animals had to die so that the man and woman could have a new beginning and be back into fellowship with God. What that means is this is, this is a picture, the first picture in the scripture here of understanding that Jesus was the sacrificial lamb who gave his life by coming down the stairway of heaven, putting on skin, was tempted in all like manner, but yet never sinned. And he died on a cross when he died for the sinful world so that you and I can lead our families, gentlemen, as God leads us. So I asked you today, men, will you man up, stand up, and own up and lead as God has made you to lead. Ladies, when your man begins to lead, I challenge you to follow him when he's leading in the way that God would have him to lead. Now, what I'm going to do in just a moment, I'm going to ask every man here to stand. Do not stand yet. But when I asked you to stand, you're standing for the fact that you want to stand up to say, you know what, I'm going to man up today. I'm going to stand up for what's right. I'm going to take ownership even when I have messed up and done things wrong. God has created you men to be able to do amazing things. And if, that's, if you want to be the man, the husband, the father, the leader for your family, the leader for our church, and the leader for our community to make a difference now and forever, if that's what you truly want to do down in the very depths of your soul, I want to ask you to stand right where you're at right now. Now, don't stand if you don't mean it. Nobody's going to judge you. This is a judgment-free zone at Freedom Church. But what we're going to do, man, I want to lead you in a prayer. And as as I lead you in a prayer, I want you to mean it from the depths of your soul. I want you to recite it out loud, and we're going to shake the very pits of hell. We're going to shake the gates of hell today at Freedom Church. We're going to rise up and be the men God created to be. So are you ready to go, men? Heavenly Father. We praise your name name. as the Lord God. God. Please help me to man up. Please help me to to stand up. Please help me to own up to to be the man you created me to be. be be. Help me to be able to follow you. you. Help me to be able to lead my wife. To lead my children, to be a leader in my home, to be a leader in my church, to be a leader in my community, to make a difference now and forever. God, you're going to call the shots. I'm not going to love you in part. I'm going to love you as a whole. Thank you, Father.
Now, as we continue to pray right now, the very thing that the enemy does to all humanity is he wants you to delay. The enemy has plans of attack against your life to put off something that never gets done. So as I ask the rest of you to stand, the greatest decision that you'll ever make in your life is to make Jesus the Lord of your life, the Lord God of your life, that he is not part of your life, but he is leading your life. And that begins with salvation in Jesus Christ. So if you've never given your heart to Jesus Christ, he's knocking right now because the Holy Spirit is here. Where two or three are gathered in his name, he promised to be in our midst. So right now, don't let the enemy cheat you out of what God is wanting to do in your heart and in your life right now. If you've never prayed and you know that you've maybe been a religious person, but religion's in your head, but you've never had a relationship with Jesus in your heart, this is your moment. Don't be ashamed of who you're standing beside. It maybe it's the one that is your wife, or maybe it's your husband, or maybe it's the one you're engaged to. Rise up in this occasion, men, women, boys, and girls, and become who God created you to be. So if you've never asked Jesus in your heart, and you know he's knocking on your soul, and you need to pray and ask him to be the Lord of your life, man up and woman up right now and, and raise your hand and say, I need to receive Jesus as my Lord and Savior. Shoot your hand up right now. Don't worry about it. I see that hand right there. God bless you. Anyone else, just shoot your hand up. Hold your hand up a minute till I see your hand. Just shoot your hand up right now. God bless you. Thank you. God bless you. Anyone else, just shoot your hand up and say, I need to, I see your hand, young man. God bless you. God bless you. Anyone else, just shoot your hand up and say, I need to make Jesus the Lord of my life. I'm not going to miss this for anything. I'm not going to let the devil. God bless you. I see your hand. God bless you. Anyone else, just shoot your hand up and say, I, I need Jesus as the Lord of my life. Because Jesus is either the Lord of your life or he's not Lord at all in your life. All right, if you've lifted your hand, I want to just help you to be able to pray. And right now, God is fixing it change your life and give you his peace. Just pray to him right where you're at and just tell him, say, Lord God in heaven, I invite you into my life. I open my heart to you. I ask you to be the Lord God over everything. I believe your son Jesus died for me to take care of my sins. Please forgive me of my sins. Forgive me of all my wrongdoing. I ask you to save my soul. My life is yours. And if you prayed that and you meant that from the depths of your soul, thank him for that right where you're at. He's going to give you peace that passes any human words you could ever recite. And he's going to give you the presence and power of his Holy Spirit. You'll never be alone again. He's going to lead you and guide you. I want to know about it. Please come and see me. Let us know about this. Your next step is to be baptized. There's no greater time to do it than next Sunday. Be sure you sign up for that. God, we thank you. We praise you. We honor you. We thank you for what you're doing right now. Thank you that everyone has been on the up and up with you today. Thank you for your plan for men and women in this world that we lead in your likeness and in your image. Amen. We're going to go into a time of worship right now. And we're going to go into a time of communion. And as we do, I want to ask you right now to come out and get the communion. This is for Christians. If you're not a Christian yet, you can't celebrate a king you don't know. But this is a time that when you come and pick the elements, you go back and search your heart. You examine your soul that there's nothing between you and God, that your heart is pure. You ask for that forgiveness, that Jesus is the Lord of your life, and you recommit your life to Him. On Thursday night, whenever He went to be with His disciples, He set up what we call the Lord's Supper, that Jesus asked us to remember His death of what he's done for each of us, and that's what we're about to do. So what I'm going to ask you to do is be sure that you look at each one of these communion stations, that you go out and be sure that you kind of like a car, you're going to go down to the right, and you're going to come back on the left, and go back to your seat, examine your heart, then I'll come back, and we will take the elements together as we pray over those. But this is a time to remember Jesus. Come for those of you that want to partake in this.